Professor Chidambaram, and uh, I think Dr. Vishnu Bhatt is also must be here, my colleague. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. The topic for discussion or for this CME program is environment mission. And I call them as voiceless victims because if, if suppose somebody comes with, with a, probably an unstable angina and then they go and then get treated, by the time they leave the hospital, they will only also ask for, oh, see, if you have had this lab here, if you had this cath lab here, so many things can be done and immediately things get sanctioned for them. Whereas when it comes to children, they are after all a very small bed, develop bed, very small space is required. And sometimes when they come and then they die silently, these victims of envenomation uh, never even uh, come near the screen. So this particular topic, I have certain specific learning objectives for the students who have logged in today is to identify the clinical presentations and to have standard guidelines. And I think uh, this uh, year 2020, which has been a year of science, has also told, uh, talked to us about uh, guidelines for a number of So this will be, I have no conflict of interest in this particular, uh, I mean, interaction with you. In the next 30 minutes or so, I would take you through these points is it a really a problem? Is it a, a problem of, well, it has been a lifelong problem. It has been an age long problem. So we would talk to you about the burden. And number two is when we have guidelines, it focuses on very specific way of going through a treatment. So evolution of guidelines and approach. The approaches keep changing depending upon what is available, depending upon the technology and depending upon the available resources. So it is called IQR approach, identify, quantify, and rectify. And of course, the clinical profile, we are primarily initial patients come to us to be, uh, to be talked to, to be inquired, then to be examined, and then only uh, to be given the tests. So the clinical profile is first, but at the same time, I cannot say that uh, investigations are uh, not important, they're equally important. But then the clinical profile, once we understand what the mind does not know, the eye cannot see. And then we go on to specific treatment, which should be cost effective, but at the same time should also have an evidence of proof that it is good. And last, last not but the least, but probably this is the most important, how to prevent it. 2.8 million people uh, have been bitten by snake all over the world. So this is a global emergency. And, and if 5 million bites every year, there are nearly uh, 100,000 uh, deaths per year. But in India, I, the mortality rate is somewhere around 14%. Uh, Why? Figures, every time we talk about figures, is it necessary to document? Yes. Unless we are factful, policy makers cannot make, allocate resources. They cannot know how much to give. And so very important is we have to be very factual. And this factualness is just not, just for getting some funds. The factualness has to be to understand the real burden, to understand the trend of a particular problem. Now, do all countries have uh, snake bite innovation data? Yes, data is important. And this global burden of snake bite is being periodically done as we are now doing it for the corona. And of course, with uh, certain areas with uh, a slightly a gray literature, but now this has improved over time as uh, uh, we see the importance of collecting correct data. People say it is a neglected medical condition. I think if you look into the editorial of Lancet 10 years back, among the neglected tropical diseases and also among the neglected medical conditions, snake bite, because they will just not attribute it, they will give it some other label and then they say it had happened because of snake bite. 
And snake bite is observed in all age groups and majority is between 11 to 50 years because this is the place that people are very active and there's an exploring nature for the children as well as for the adults. Now, if we look at the peak ages, and it's exactly in the monsoon months, and in places which have now turned out to be concrete jungles, as we are building more and more into the available land space, these also migrate. They are also like migrant workers who come to another place to stay. So definitely, I think snake bite mortality is there among that. The highest state is in Andhra Pradesh, and of course, uh, you have uh, the figures which are available everywhere. And in Tamil Nadu, also, we do have um, figures which is uh, somewhere around 5.1 to 6.5. And Tamil Nadu is something very peculiar because the Irula community, which is uh, the ones who are basically providing the anti uh, venom, the material for the anti venom, they are in the Mahabalipuram region. And I think this is where the snake park, which is in Vandalur, has become a very important thing for us. And so definitely we are contributing in a large way uh, to this uh, uh, national as well as a global problem. So now if we look at the IQR approach, now that we have understood that this is really a problem with your burden, the snake envenomation uh, went through a number of uh, protocols because everything was very empiric. And uh, if one is good, the two must be better and three must be best. So people started pumping in uh, so much of anti-snake venom that uh, either the patient died or the patient recovered. And also he developed immune complex nephritis later on. So what had happened is uh, so much of budget of a hospital went on to just uh, procure anti-snake venom. And we were never knowing whether this is uh, the correct dose in the correct time. And this is where I think the national snake bite protocol consultation meeting, which the Ministry of Health, along with ICMR, started in August 2007. And subsequently, a lot of interest came up in Southeast Asia office. And so 2016, you had a, again a revised. And now 2017 document is the latest one in which both the document contains the guidelines both for adults as well as children. So this is the genesis of the guidelines in which the snake bite research initiative which was started in uh, by David Warren. Uh, he had come for that initial meeting at Angamali in Kerala and uh, subsequently uh, in the ministry. And then it went all around. So this is the first document which came on snake bite identification, the first aid and treatment. And be because today's CME is on office practice, I think this particular component of first aid and this thing becomes very important. And of course, things have to change. I mean, we have to keep on reviewing uh, whether whatever we have been doing has consolidated and we cannot just keep on latching on to the world. So is there any need for a change for a new guideline? And that is what has come in 2017, the standard treatment guidelines. Now we talk about Oxford vaccines and everything for Corona. And remember, I think this goodness and sharing of wisdom from Dr. Ian Simpson from Oxford University was a turning point for us at uh, uh, Jipmer where we worked and he had been a source of energy for this initial meeting. And of course, with so much of work done by the snake bite research group, ultimately they, it went on to a, what is called an Afro-Asian protocol. And in the Asia, I think the Pakistan Medical Research Council also agreed upon it, probably the only time when we were united on uh, some protocol. So the, and right now it is the Africa. <coughs> so the most important thing, if you look into the Indian Journal, Indian Pediatrics, do it right. And I think this slogan was from Dr. Ian Simpson. Right. Reassure the patient. Immobilize the same way as you would for a fractured limb. Get to the hospital immediately and tell the doctor of any systemic symptoms. And I think this slogan is the most important, I would say, Tarak Mandram or something like that for this thing. So it is a first aid treatment. We should not, I'll also show you what is first no aid treatment in another slide. Most important thing is transport. 
I think transport is very critical, which we realize this is the conventional transport, which we still uh, see in uh, places. It doesn't mean that things have not improved. Yes, definitely now is 108. And even the story of origin of 108 was due to a slave trade. A worker, a British worker who was in the Bayer's pharmaceuticals in Hyderabad, got bitten by a snake during her one of her evening walks in her uh, fact, I mean in her establishment garden. And she got bitten by a snake and she had to be uh, moved to the nearest uh, government facility, the government uh, nearest center. When she went to a corporate center there, they just said, no, we don't treat snake bite uh, because if she dies, uh, the postmortem will be done only by the uh, government doctor. So please take her. From me. And by the time she reached a government facility, she died. And this led everybody to take it up to the highest thing at that point. Late Dr. Rajesh Reddy was the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh. And with our Honorable President Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, they realized that probably life is time and transport is something very important. And that is how the 108 came and all the protocols for snake bite got come because this was a foreigner's death in our land. And Definitely, things had changed so much after this 108 had come into the Indian East. So the most important thing is, do it right. You have to immobilize as you would for yeah, pressure immobilization. Now, if, and you can see that splint which is uh, uh, put here, because if a patient is going to keep on shaking his hand that I am uh, got bitten here and he just does what is called a snake walk to the nearest center, definitely whatever are the molecules which are there, they get pumped by the muscle into the systemic circulation and he is going to get uh, envenomed faster. And uh, some people get faster envenomation, some later. This may depend upon the molecular weight of the uh, proteins which are uh, present in the uh, venom. The venom is nothing but uh, yeah, light, it's a cocktail. It is a cocktail of uh, proteins. And uh, the speed with which it goes will depend upon the mobility. And that is where I think in the first aid, most important thing is you have to put pressure, but not pressure so tight that the circulation gets obstructed. So this has to be a pressure without <coughs> immobilization. This was done in Australia and a number of doctors have been trained on these things and still people are doing it. Now, important thing is 70% of snake bites are from non-venomous species. Only 50% are from venomous species, they really envenom them. So we have to reassure the patient because Pamba Kanda, Padayun Nadungon, they will say. So it is a question of the reassurance, which is what is important. Number two, immobilize the patient as is done for a fractured limb. The rationale is, of course, for children, we can carry them and see to it that they don't move it. But adult, the bandages or cloth should be used to hold the splints in place and not to block the blood supply or apply pressure. Use of tight ligatures to apply any kind of compression is a danger and they do not work. Get to the hospital immediately. In fact, there had been even some TV serials which just said that if you keep the patient awake throughout the night by making some songs or something like that, the patient, the venom would go away from the body. Maybe some of them got better because they were non-venomous snakes. Or maybe, but majority of the get to the hospital immediately, GH. So the rationale is there is no proven benefit in the treatment of snake bite with the use of traditional remedies. T, tell tale signs. The doctor should be told about any small signs which they have noticed as they come, such as ptosis that may manifest on the way to hospital. Because sometimes in the evenings, when some of the people come and wait in a health center, and then they look, they may have ptosis really after work in the uh, getting bitten by a thing, but then they will say a muffler, maybe that is why uh, this ptosis is there, and they may never be taken care of. He goes home, and then again he comes back with a respiratory paralysis. So, the important thing is telltale signs help you to prepare the treatment plan. Yes, as I said, first no aid treatment, the pressure immobilization, which is so tight, like this tool will be. And if uh, this particular snake stone, I have seen it in a center, which is just 10 kilometers from Jipmer in this center, they will take this black stone and then ask the patient to go and buy milk from the nearby booth and come and then put the uh, thing on the wound and then take the stone and then put it into the milk. And if the milk turns blue, they say it is poisonous. Otherwise, it is not poisonous. So you understand that there is a lot of myths and beliefs which surround the snake bite. 
and uh, of course in rajasthan more punki because as uh, dr srinivasan had said gilamar i mean lord muruga sir lord muruga is more uh, can travel so they tend to put uh, this kind of a tourniquet with uh, or some alum or they go for some place so i understand we don't question their culture but what i am saying is time is like golden hours do not exist only for coronary syndromes they exist for almost all conditions and of course this is a bollywood way of um, treating uh, giving first aid cut it suck it and then put the tupata around it and then uh, send it off so these are all not inapplicable snake bite first aid now we'll go to the next point that is the iqr okay once the snake is uh, sometimes they kill the snake and then they bring it and by looking at the snake sometimes we are able to say okay this is a viper this is a cobra or this is a sea snake and uh, so uh, hepatologists have come out with lot of books and even the uh, things in the uh, snake park in chennai they have uh, put uh, good books in which we can be able to identify the snake or we have to identify the symptoms as doctors then we quantify for the coagulation profile and then we have to rectify only with anti snake of course so many of uh, snakes just like so many snakes which are available but the most important thing is once a patient is treated with snake bite he recovers fine the story does not end there but after that you will find that, that the necrosis which it has produced the amount of uh, sort of a challenging to his own mobility which it has produced well, he will then come under uh, orthopedically challenged uh, person i mean this is the foot of a, a person who got treated and who came to give his wedding invitation after a number of years so you can understand this has happened but then they have learned to live with it but again this could uh, be uh, prevented <coughs> and of course they used to say there are big fours but now there are also some more uh, snakes which have been identified especially the hump nose pit viper which is in the backwaters of kerala and some of these do not respond to our conventional anti snake so when you come with a non critical arrival when were you bitten what were you doing and what first aid is given i think this is all important questions to be asked not that you waste lot of time in questioning them you just have one look and then you know what now uh, initially i think about snake bite we were taught only in the forensic medicine classes Uh, uh there they used to say if you have um, uh, one mark, two marks then it is venomous if there are multiple marks it is non venomous so no, i think such kind of a conclusion about bite marks is very inconclusive because if you can even see here that you find that this uh, type of tea which fang uh, which the uh, snake has uh, cannot uh, make this conclusion uh, right and especially some of these snakes in uh, rice are kukri snakes and few other things they have a different type of venom concentration then tourniquet removal has to be done and you have to wait keep observing for late onset envenoming and a 24 hour observation is better it is better to uh, over admit patients rather than send them away and they will come back with south lord the pandumadi they will come back again with uh, uh, respiratory paralysis so this observation is important and for pain of course no aspirin because we know about now snake identification the fang marks may not be visible the bite site may not be painful so very important thing is we have to do it right when it really matters and this is the girl for whom it could have been a bad morning with just i think here a night she had but in morning she complained of some abdominal pain and by the time she reached the hospital she was having a respiratory difficulty and because we know that crate is a notorious for making this kind of a thing and this is where i think fang marks may not be visible the bite site may not be painful <coughs> and this was the girl who recovered from crate bite so presentation our concern is asymptomatic or symptomatic whether it is going to be critical or non critical high index of suspicion should be maintained now the other group <coughs> which comes with ptosis <coughs> with a swelling and with a neck flop and again here you can see the ptosis which is due to the russell swiper <coughs> so both neuro paralysis also can occur with russell swiper though we know that hematological is what is the scene that you have bleeding manifestation a student going across for a tuition and then coming back in the highway got bitten by a snake and then he comes with this swelling <coughs> so the important thing is this 20 minutes cold blood clotting then does his blood coagulate or not 
So this 20 minutes full blood clotting time, most important thing is with what you do it, a clean, dry test tube. It requires 2 ml of fresh venous blood and incoalable blood is an undisputed diagnostic of a viper bite in India and certainly removes any <coughs> doubt of any lactic blood. <laughs> So we do what is called a syndromic identification, hemotoxic viper, <coughs> neurotoxic great cobra Russell's viper, and we find that acute kidney injuries is most often seen with the Russell's viper and hump nose tepid viper. <laughs> most important thing is sometimes we think that they have some gum bleeds, certain other things. These are all due to certain uh, molecules in the venom. In fact, this. Uh, as I said, it's a cocktail of protein and it also makes every receptor in the body uh, gets affected. So you have what is called the neurotoxins and which uh, inhibits acetylcholine release from the presynaptic receptors. And postsynaptic is for cobra venom and metalloproteinases activation of factor 10. And these are all uh, activators of the prothrombin. So these are all the bases on which you will get abnormal coagulation tests. Spontaneous systemic bleeding after viper bite. You can see where all, especially the gum bleeding, and especially sometimes in the morning, afternoon, the villagers go for an ablution. And they also uh, come back with the snake bite. So, this is very clear about this post synaptic vehicle. It is nothing but an inhibition, the acetylcholine in the vesicles, and then this is uh, the venom goes and occupies this thing. So, it's a post synaptic environment. Whereas in a crate, it is the complete destruction of all the vesicles. So as a result, it is going to take time for these vesicles to regenerate. So in a <clears throat> presynaptic crate, you may have to wait for the entire neurotoxicity uh, to uh, come back to normalcy. So when any case comes, we look at, is the possible bite? Yes, he is asymptomatic and he has got normal coagulation tests. Remove the pressure bandage and observe for four hours if he is bad. Sometimes you can even keep him for 12 hours, depending upon the clinical condition. The next important thing is this human clotting cascade is something it uh, straight away uh, does this procoagulant affects these factors and then you go in for the uh, venom induced coagulopathy. Now remember, this is a dynamic picture which evolves. Within one hour, you will get all these symptoms. That is the idea of keeping them under observation. No, no, headache, okay, paracetamol, and then um, transient hyposeria, I don't know. What is important is this observation over this one hour, a hand on the pulse and a look at the patient. And I think it is this clinical examination which is going to make us uh, look at the evolution of symptoms. One to three hours, it will go in for a paralysis. That is why somebody said, if somebody has got a facial as well as a brachial and also bulbar paralysis, think of snake bite unless proved otherwise. Just like as we say, some child comes with a priapism and then sweating, it is scorpion sting. Here, this is the snake bite. And after three hours, you get, so everything goes on with what is called a legendary speed with which these molecules travel and then occupy all these receptors and produce this. And you can also get a dark urine or acute renal failure also acutely. And for see more north and also in Madurai area, this used to be a very common thing. So rapid illness develops after multiple bites in small child. So we went through what is called, a, initially we talked about possible bite. Now we are coming to a definite bite, mild symptoms, abnormal coagulation times, then remove the pressure bandage, observe for 12 hours if well, and again always inform ICU about any patient can come in to it. Don't think emergency and ICU are nothing but two doors, one door revolves it together. There is nothing that this is an unit and that unit is something separate. This kind of a compartmentalization is what causes a delay. So, and I think in the practice, we need to uh, look at such delays are uh, obviously avoided. Now, if we look at certain simple diagnostic methods, we find 20 minutes old blood clotting time is the false positive in a non envenomed patient and suggesting a high specificity. Important, what is this 20 minutes? Clotting time is not 20 minutes, but important thing is you give the body so much time that if it has to clot, it should have done at least by 20 minutes. If it has not done, definitely this is an abnormal bleeding. Number two is progressive weakness, which is called a single breath count, or the length of time an upward gaze can be maintained in a patient, or basic grip tests. I think these things by which you can find out that the neurotoxicity is evolving or is worsening. 
The next important thing is painful progressive swelling of the limb, measurement of the circumference of the limb. And the simple measurement is sometimes important because it rapidly crosses the joint, definitely it is important. So you have a patient who is possible or you have a patient who is dependent, but symptoms are not much involved, but or you may come with a very ill patient who comes straight away to your OP, I mean to your practice with hypertension, bleeding, paralysis. And leave the bandage on because ASV supplies, once they are insured, then after that you can uh, take the bandage out because uh, removing the bandage only when a patient is stable. Sometimes we find that you, you will find that suddenly removing the patient may cause a gush of the venom which is accumulated proximally to go into the circulation and the patient will be worse. So remove the bandage only when he is stable and always have an adrenaline pre-medication uh, for before the first dose of anti. So critical arrival, I don't have to uh, again stress on these things. And the important thing is you need to have a straight away and an access. It is not that the moment a patient like that comes, uh, it, it is not that immediately he has to go. Whatever has to be done at your primary level has to go. The venom has to, at least these are the primary things which we need to do. Establish large bore IV access and test for the presence of pulse distal to the 2PK. If pulse is absent, ensure a doctor is present before removal of the ligatures. In case of clinically confirmed venomous bites, remove the tourniquet only after starting loading dose of ASV and keep adrenaline injection and carry out a simple medical assessment, including history and uh, <clears throat> this thing, exact on record. So very important uh, thing is uh, clinical examination and recording of finding. But remember that you this is the minimum thing which we can do, though you may not be able to uh, treat it completely because of your own uh, difficulties. I think one doctor said, sir, if we give this ASV and all these things here and tomorrow something happens, that will be a roadblock uh, between uh, the hospital and uh, this thing. But uh, it doesn't prevent us uh, from at least attending to the important things, which is, uh, OK, this is a common scene in which a patient comes for it. And of course, now algorithms are important because once you put algorithms in your own unit, you'll be able to see them and see uh, where he or the child falls into, whether it is a painful progressive swelling, viper, neuroparalytic cobra, vasculotoxic is saw scale, and myotoxic is flat scale. Uh, so you have the treatment which is available and main treatment is supportive ASV or supportive and then <coughs> transfusions. So I'll go through rapidly uh, these things because it is the, nothing but a syndromic identification in which we talk about cobra, treat, and like. The, even when symptoms have persisted for several days in hemostatic, the ASV may reverse the systemic uh, envelope. <laughs> symptoms require the appropriate to give ASV. Uh, local symptoms are very important. And the Glasgow Coma Scale cannot be used to assess the level of consciousness of patients paralyzed by neurotoxicity. So we have all these clues which are uh, presented to identify that this is uh, definitely an I do for two important things. One is the uh, Tender lymphadenopathy, number one. Number two, pain in the renal angle. If you have pain in the renal angle, especially to remember that these are the patients who can go in for an acute kidney failure first. And clinical features like time lag and reverse order, in which this is how it takes for the recovery to take place. And you do have uh, everything available in a primary center. And of course, people say neostigmine can be given along with it. But neostigmine is only a test. It is to say whether the prolonging the life of acetylcholine, which is uh, present, and if there is no response beyond two hours, I think we should stop that. Now, ASV dosage. Now, what to give, we are very clear. How, how to give it, and what is this ASV dosage? It is found that for the amount of venom, which is again, this Myanmar scientist who found it, that uh, around for this, this will neutralize roughly so much of venom and 10 vials in one hour at a steady rate, this is important. And there is no test dose because test dose can only find out enough lactic because it is IgE mediated. But here it is complement mediated. So the test dose is of no use. So it is only an anaphylactoid reaction, which we need to understand. So this anti-snake venom is available in two ways. One is lyophilized as well as liquid. And depending on the advantages, depending on the shelf life and requiring a cold chain is what is, and when to give, ASV, when you have 20 minutes whole blood clotting time at normal, you have a current systemic bleeding, and you have neurotoxic signs. Severe current local swelling, half the bitten in the absence of a tool, and rapidly crossing, these are strong indications for ASV. 
and asv in the children as well as in adults it is the same because the snakes inject the same amount of venom into adults and children but why not testos as i told you it is usually not ig mediated but complement activated and these may presensitize the patient and create a greater risk very important and i think this is fair i think i found that the steady slow and steady kind of an approach which is important which i think we had seen symptomatology is of no help to determine the severity of envenomation as it is constantly evolving the initial dose is 8 to 10 vials the reconstituted vial in normal saline or 5% textos has to run slowly over 1 hour or even 120 minutes because we lost a child because somebody said okay why not uh, neutralize the venom very fast and they ran it as if they were giving a 10 ml per kg bolus and once the infusion went in like that the patient went in for a severe protein shock because these immunoglobulins produce a protein shock and after that whatever we do was only a last minute trauma so very important thing is the slow and steady uh, infusion is something very important one hour at a constant rate with hemodynamic monitoring and i think i will again and again stress because uh, we learn a lot of things from a mouse by googling but wisdom comes only through our mistakes again repeat those do you think it is again repeated yes reassessment for unimproving symptoms in hematoxic 6 hours in neurotoxic you have to do it within 1 to 2 hours and the upper limit for viperin bite had been only 30 vials and that too it was in a mother who had an antipartum hemorrhage and then she was bitten by a snake and of course neurotoxic more than 20 vials will not be of any value so a timeline based approach we need to have this so of course these are some patients who are on ventilator and then who are extubated because of uh, later and we should also know what is called the locked in syndrome now more important than this it is a question of asv being given and you look at their reaction this is what everybody is afraid of suppose in fact at one point people were afraid of benzetine penicillin because of uh, it produces reaction so everything went in for then a oral penicillin and oral penicillin was as good as probably no penicillin at all so reaction treatment the first sign or symptom you need to look at expose the chest in fact the first sign of a rash comes in the chest then after that the body comes so uh, you will find here and you have to give uh, adrenaline im because we were more used to giving subcutaneous but remember in subcutaneous the plasma time is 34 minutes in im it is 8 minutes and also with the steroid support <laughs> so this was the study from sri lanka which said that initially having a steroid support may be of use maybe hydrocortisone takes 4 hours but adrenaline is very important and this is something like we should not be afraid if this thing happens okay stop the drip and then after that again start uh, continuing the drip in a steady and slow manner this is something like a pit stop which we do in a formula race in formula race if something goes wrong with the wheel it is not that they stop the race uh, further they come out pit get everything arranged fast and then they continue their job i think asv giving is something similar to uh, that by because the reaction has come we should not stop it is not a question of uh, a fear of the if uh, fear of the unknown or now it is not a question of uh, once bitten twice shy we have to continue because asv is the only uh, treatment and give it in a steady manner under monitor asv when not to go when there is no local progressive swelling isolated thrombocytopenia does not warrant it just to treat renal failure no and late recovery from a ventilator especially in a trade bite and asv is of no use at all complications surgical surgeons they come to us especially some of them come with this kind of a picture also and there's a pain on passive stretching pain out of proportion pulselessness pallor paresthesia and paralysis you have uh, what is called the decompartment you know the fasciotomy has to be done and local tissue necrosis secondary to this is where i think our plastic surgeons come to our great help what requires is only a time patience and uh, regular uh, dressing so the recovery time is what is we are seeing spontaneous systemic bleeding stops in 15 to 30 minutes when you give asv coagulability is restored every 6 hours why the 6 hours is the liver takes 6 hours for the factors to be regenerated then we have post synaptic type in which 30 minutes after the venom uh, it can uh, in co cobra they recover very fast whereas in trait it may take a longer time to improve and even it has taken a week when patients has been on ventilator and then they have come out of it and shock the patient sometimes we find within th starting 30 to 60 minutes their shock also improves so these are the timelines which we should remember for that and of course a long hospital stay and then with uh, uh, this uh, uh, grafting patient has uh, improves so
and severity of admission. This is where I think school health programs can tell children how to handle a first aid after snake bite because you know, everywhere, every school has got a garden. So definitely it is not that we are going to be free of uh, snakes. We have learned to live with them, but at least we know how to uh, go about when, because this is an important factor. Patients running after a bite increases the rate of absorption. Then the nature of first aid given and time elapsed before the first close of venom. Availability of inter-hospital transport services is very important. And of course, this is a, a Jipmer experience in which uh, we had uh, looked at the younger age, walking for more than one kilometer. These are the things which affected the outcome. And of course, in 2016, another similar study came from Calicut Medical College, a very nice, good, important study, which also uh, talks about all these factors as <clears throat> the risk factors for a poor outcome. Because the important thing is people keep asking you, okay, will my, this patient be all right or not? So based on such evidences only, you can give them uh, some sort of a, 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 a facts or educated guesses, we can say. Now we have what is called the locked-in syndrome, which can happen in great. And it is a neurological, which is defined by sustained eye opening, preserved awareness, hyponia, quadriplegia, and there are three types, which is classic, incomplete, or total. So these are for uh, finding it out. And uh, remember, it is this kind of a, a brain dead uh, state. People were about to give it up, but then the PICU with ventilated support. I remember this was the uh, one student called uh, with us, MD student Neha Ataria, when she went to Delhi, and I think she. Uh, communicated with us uh, in which you know this uh, giving ASV not losing hope especially in this uh, lockdown syndrome uh, helped uh, so most important thing is this was how PHCs were at one particular point of time where they were even uh, doing cesarean section in Ramnathapuram uh, things but now I think with the litigant society uh, that is but then at least when you transport a patient you can transport him with uh, airway protected especially in crate, because many of the crates, when they reach the hospital, they are already uh, paralyzed, respiratory paralysis is already set in. So important thing is, this would be asking for the ideal, it was there, and it all depends upon uh, the way in which uh, things are taken. So how snake bite can be avoided? Education, know your local snakes, the sort of place they live in. Be especially vigilant about snakes after rains, flooding, and at harvest time. Try to wear proper shoes and long trousers. Wearing shoes is not for fashion. Uh, especially even in Jipmer campus, or even in front of it, a very senior surgeon, and he was coming for a walk in uh, that uh, the AAR quarters and uh, Jipmer quarters. He got bitten by a snake. So what is important is wherever you walk, use a light, and that is very important. And this is what you know, village people, whenever they walk in dark, they always carry or lander, they always carry. So how snake bite can be avoided? And avoid snakes handle threatened affected to Keep young children away from snake infested areas. Check for school benches after vacation. Check socks, pillows, and sleeping mat. This also applies for Scorpio. And avoid rubbish, thatched roof. They can fall from. So these are some risk activities which can <coughs> produce this thing, especially cutting the grass, carrying like this. So you understand that these are all occupational hazards. Of course, now with a lot of. Uh, such Bharat, I think this is lesser ring, but then this is again a risk factor. Corona or snake, both do not discriminate. We are all in this together. And as a result, now we have found whatever are the supportive things which are required for Corona. I think we have been doing it earlier for snake in a different way. So, but I think we need to continue this. And for prevention, of course, this is malaria. They will put a net and other things. And at least sleep, don't sleep on the ground. Sources. Very important thing is this information should be available because you may not <coughs> always remember certain things. When lawyers can have so many law books and refer it whenever they want it, we also have to have some source of information. And these are the two uh, sources. So let me going to conclude saying that protocol guided treatment is very important. ASV should be administered at a constant rate of infusion, allocating resources in a <coughs> primary health center and enhancing the confidence. Now our confidence levels to handle <coughs> corona has improved over the years. At one point, people were even afraid to go nearby. In fact, I still remember there were people who were even afraid to see rabies cases when they came to the casualty in GH in those days. So as a result, now uh, our confidence levels has increased because now uh, emergency management has now become the order of the day, uh, thanks to corona. And as for medical treatment, a new knowledge means definitely there's going to be a change in I am going to leave you for your lunch, uh, probably thinking that uh, life is uh, 
like a pizza. Pizza confuses us. It comes in a square box. When you open it, it is round. 